GameSci.com Welcome to GameSci.com I am Professor Chris Ferguson Hello and welcome to the lesson on classes and objects This is by far the most important lesson when it comes to an object oriented programming language be it Java, C++, or C Sharp if you're an object oriented language you need to understand classes and objects and this is very much the most important lesson of any object oriented programming class. The class is the blueprint or definition for creating an object so understanding the relationship between a class is very 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 important. A class is to an object uh, a class is an object, it's sort of like the DNA is to you. It's the full definition of the object. Uh, you cannot have an object without a class. The, cl the class is used to create the object. Other examples that describe this relationship is like a blueprint to a house. Right? An architect builds a blueprint, which is a complete specification on how to create a house. Then someone takes that blueprint and builds a house out of it. Well guess what? A class is a blueprint and someone takes that blueprint and builds an object out of it. Another way to think of it is like a recipe to a cake. What is a recipe? It's a set of instructions printed on a piece of paper on a computer screen. What is a cake? A delicious dessert. Clearly they're not exactly the same thing but the recipe is a full description. The list of ingredients, the steps to take on creating that cake. So the recipe is the instructions for creating the cake. You can think of a class as the instructions for creating an object. You can think of a blueprint as the instructions for creating a house. So you get in that relationship between a class and an object. Although they're not exactly the same thing, they are very related. A simpler way to think of a class is can you declare a few variables? Could you declare an int, a double, a char? Could you declare a few variables? Well, you're halfway to creating a class. Can you write a few methods? Shouldn't be too hard. We had a lesson on writing methods. Um, if you can declare a few variables and write a few methods, guess what? You know what you need to write a class and therefore build an object. That's all a class is, a set of variables and a set of methods. It's pretty darn simple. If you were paying attention to the earlier lessons, then you should be able to build a class. Now, a class requires uh, declaring a header for the class. We're going to create a public class enemy here. Uh, public means we want everybody to have access. It. Um, the keyword class is a requirement. And then what are we going to name it? I decided to create a class enemy. Now, an enemy doesn't have to be a villain. An enemy is anything that can affect your character during the video game. So you're programming a video game, you have a main character, a hero, uh, that is supposed to do something, and anything that could hurt that hero is basically an enemy. So it could be a vampire, or it could be a drone, it could be a falling anvil. A falling anvil, if it lands on your character and creates damage, that's an enemy to your character. So we're going to build this public class enemy, which describes something that can hurt the main character of our video game. And most important here is this keyword class. Class is what declares what we're building. Again, this is called the header of the class. And we're saying we want to build a new class. A class is then used to build objects. So we have to declare that we're building a class. About the only thing that changes on this line from program to program is the name of the thing that we're building. Um, just like variables should have good names, classes should have good names. Class enemy describes anything that could do damage. If I was building a class car, call it car. If I was building a class book, call it book. Give your class a good descriptive name that describes the thing you're trying to represent. And what we're trying to represent here is anything. A vampire, a drone, an anvil that can attack or hurt the main character of our video game. So give the class a good name very very important a descriptive name that describes what that class slash object is at the top of the class I always like to declare my variables turns out you can declare your variables wherever you want 
but we need some standards and I like the variables declared at the top of the class so when I'm looking at it I can see exactly what I'm dealing with so please please declare your variables at the top of the class you can see from the arrow here um, these will be the variables that will be part of our object when we actually do build an object an object is sort of a mega variable that can have multiple pieces of information stored in it and when you declare the variables in the class you're saying these are the variables or data that I want to store in my object you also have to write some methods inside the class notice how the variables and methods are inside the curly braces anything declared inside or created inside the curly braces will be part of the object when it's built so an object is going to have variables and methods you've got to write the methods in the class in order for your object to be able to execute those methods again declaring variables and writing methods were from previous lessons I'm assuming you can do it uh, this is sort of an abstract version of uh, public class enemy um, I don't feel the need at this point to show you actual code here we'll do that in the next slide uh, but if you declare a few variables and write a few methods you've got what you need to build a new class and hence create an object. Now the curly braces here are most most important. I put underlines under the curly braces so you can see them a little better. Um, if you're between those curly braces you're a part of the class and then therefore will be part of the object when the object is built. If you are outside those curly braces you are most definitely not part of the class and you will not be part of the object. So it's important to understand where the curly braces are so concentrate on the curly braces when you're building a class. Inside the curly braces, you'll be part of the class and object. Outside, you will not be part of the class and therefore not part of the object. Now the key here, where it goes from being a class and an object, is when you run the program. An object is a runtime entity. It does not get created until the program is executing or running. If you're in the editor and you're typing code in, you're working on the class. If the program is running, then you may have an object. It's important to understand that an object is a runtime entity. It's after you start executing the program that the objects get created. The objects represent a chunk of computer memory. What is going to be part of that object is the variables. Any variables you declare, you'll store data in the object and the methods. The variables describe what the object is, the information that describes that object. The methods describe what the object does, the actions the object will take. So you get in the picture, the classes are the definition or blueprint for the object. The object is a runtime entity. Let's write an initial class enemy here and see how all the little pieces fit together. Uh, one thing I do want to keep in mind here is, remember, you're dealing with simple variables and methods. Keep that in mind. So let's look at writing a specific class here and what goes into it. First up is our public class enemy or the header of our class. I've highlighted also the curly braces here to show you that if you are going to be part of the class you have to between, be between those two curly braces. I've also added a comment near the end curly brace at the bottom end class enemy. I usually put that in when I'm writing a class so I know exactly where to put code that I want to be part of my class and therefore part of my object. Again this public class enemy line will be fairly consistent from different programs. The only thing that generally changes is the name of the class. Give the name of your class a descriptive name. Again we're building something here that represents something that's dangerous to the main character of our game. An enemy could be anything that hurts our main character. Variables. Here are the variables that I've decided to declare as my enemy class. The X position and Y position will describe where the enemy is located on the screen. X and Y coordinates of the enemy on the screen. This will determine whether it's at the top of the screen, the middle of the screen, or the bottom of the screen. The health variable describes the health of that enemy variable. Since it is an enemy, we assume we're trying to kill it. If it has a high health value, like 100, it means it's at full health. If it has a low health value, like 0, it means it's dead. In order to write a class, we need to declare some variables. And these are the three that I've decided for now should be part of the enemy class. As I said, we also have to write methods. Methods to define what the object does. So I'm going to build three methods here. 
One's called a constructor method, another's called a set method, and another one's called a get method. I don't have a lot of room. This is not going to be the full enemy class. I just wanted to give you a taste of the variables and methods that I would describe in building this class. Looking closer at what's called the constructor method. Constructors build objects. Who takes a blueprint and builds a house? Construction workers. Who takes a class definition and builds an object? Constructor methods. See, there's no mystery to the naming of a constructor. It helps build the object. And since we're in the class enemy, this is going to help build an enemy object. This is what's known as the default constructor. It's going to set X and Y position to 0, 0, or the top left of the screen. And it's going to set health to 100. 100, as I'm defining it, is full health. 0 is going to be dead. When the enemy reaches 0 health, it's going to be dead. Next up is what we call a set method or a setter. Set methods or setters put values in objects. Objects hold variables. Objects hold data. And whenever I want to put a new value inside the object, I call what's called a set method or a setter. The set x position method is going to provide a new value for the x coordinate. I don't have room to show all the set methods, but typically we write a set method for all the variables. So there'll be a set x position, a set y position, and a set health variable. I don't have room to do it all now, but I'm just showing you the example of a set method. And remember, set methods put values in objects. Next up is a get method or a getter. Get methods pull values from objects. Objects hold variables or data, and when I want to pull a piece of information out of an object, I call a get method, sometimes called a getter. This one is going to return the current value of the x position variable. If x position contains a zero, then this will return a zero to the caller of get x position. Now this should become more clear when we start using the enemy class and building objects out of it. So let's write a little code here to create an enemy object and use that enemy object. A class creates a new variable type. That's important to understand. You're used to variable types like int, double, and char. When you create a class enemy, you're building a new enemy type. So what I'm going to do here is declare a variable of type enemy named object. So let's run this code to create an object. Remember, the class is the blueprint for creating the object. So what we're going to show is taking that blueprint and building an object out of it. I'm going to go very slowly on this first line of code and show you all the little pieces that take place here. There's about three different steps that are going on on this one little line of code. First up, we're creating an enemy variable named object. This is called a reference variable. Variables created out of classes are called reference variables. And that first part of the line that I've got underlined in red here is declaring the variable of type enemy named object. So I'm going to show you the object variable first because that's what this part of the line of code does, declare the enemy object. Then I'm going to go over to the other side and see where it says new enemy. This is the piece of code that creates the enemy object. The new literally means allocate me a new piece of memory and then the enemy that follows it enough memory for an enemy object. Also notice the curly braces here at the end of enemy here. We're calling the constructor memory me cut that. We're calling the constructor method over here. See the curly braces on the constructor methods? See the curly braces over on this side? What we're doing is we are building a new enemy object and calling the constructor method of the enemy object. So let's go execute the constructor method of the enemy object. Uh, you can see it sets x position to 0 and I put a 0 in the x position variable. Next the constructor sets y position equal to 0 so I assign a 0 to the y position of the enemy object. And finally, I decided by default, I want the health value to be 100. When a brand new enemy object is created, it should be at full health, 100. And I assign 100 to the health variable of the enemy object. 
Remember, an object is just variables and methods, and what I'm doing is making sure those variables are initialized with proper values. Notice where the underline is. It's underneath the equal sign. Right now, I'm showing you what happens when this equal sign see that enemy object that we created on the right side I want to assign it to my object reference variable the variable object is a reference to an instance of the enemy this line here that creates the object to the reference variable that was created by this equal sign I want to assign the object I created to the reference variable object I know it's a literal name but object is a reference to an enemy and we're connecting the object to the reference in that equal sign. Now let's use that object reference to call a method. Go to the reference object and the dot says go inside that object and execute a method. This particular method we're going to execute is called set exposition. So go to the reference variable, the dot says go inside of it and execute the set exposition passing it a value of 50 as the argument for the parameter. So a 50 comes in and is in the, and that 50 that we passed is assigned to the exposition variable. So what I'm doing, as I said earlier, the set methods put values in objects. So the 50 that was passed as a parameter is then inserted or assigned to the global variable exposition. And that's all a set method does. So let's drop to the next line of code. We'll declare an int x variable this is a variable declaration int is a type x is the variable of that type so I've drawn the x variable down here then I will execute the other side of that equal statement and say object dot get exposition go to the object reference the dot says go inside of it and then let's access the get exposition method with inside the object well what does the get exposition do getters pull values from objects so all it's going to do is take that 50 that was assigned to X position and return it to the user. When it returns the 50, the value of X position to the user, what does it do with it? The equal sign says assign the 50 that got returned to the X variable. And you can see because of that equal sign, that 50 got inserted into the object. Do you see what I did there? All I did is take a 50 and take it from outside the object and put it inside the object with a set X position. I then turned around and pulled that 50 right back out with the get X position and assigned it to the variable X. And that's pretty much what an object does. You put values into an object, you pull values out of the object. There is our simple, straightforward enemy object. This is by no means intended to be a full implementation of a class enemy. Enemies are much more complicated than this, but I think it fits nicely in the screen and shows you the basic operation of an object. We have to allocate space for the object, put values into the object, and pull values out of the object. Now let's look at constructors. We looked at a constructor in the previous example. Let's look at different options we have for building constructors. Who takes a blueprint and builds a house? A construction worker. What takes a class and builds an object? A constructor method. Constructors often initialize global variables. It's not all they do, but one of the primary job of a constructor is to make sure that your variables, like x position, y position, and health, have initial values. What we're going to look at is multiple different constructors here. This is often called overloaded constructors. So let's look at our various options when it comes to building constructors. Again, this is not a complete class. What I've done is I've kind of reduced the code in order to see exactly what I want to show you. Remember, the old get and set methods are still there. But what we're going to build here is three overloaded constructors. One thing you'll notice right away is the constructor and the class names match. If I'm building a class enemy, then its constructors must have the same name, enemy. So I've squared them, I've blocked them out four times here. The class is enemy, and then I have constructor one, which is our default constructor, constructor two, which is a regular constructor, and constructor three, which is what we call a copy constructor. The next thing you'll notice about constructors is they do not have a return type. They do not return an int. They don't have a return type of void. They don't have a return type of double. 
constructors look different because they don't list a return type in front of the method name. Primarily, primarily what constructors do is they initialize global variables. Constructors are almost always public. So that's three important things that I would think you should understand about constructors. Constructors have the same name as a class. Constructors do not have a return type and constructors usually initialize global variables. So here's our variables at the top. Constructors typically assign initial values to the global variables. It's not everything a constructor does, but that's primarily what they're assigned to do. Put values in those global variables. Again, this is what we call three overloaded constructor methods. Uh, there's certainly more methods in the class. There, this is what's called the default constructor. It's the default constructor because the parameters are empty here. Uh, with no parameters, it's considered the default constructors. And what they do is they assign default values for global variables. There's almost always a default constructor in a class. And in this case, I, the programmer, decided I want the default values for X and Y position to be 0. And I want the default value for health to be 100 the programmer decides what the default value should be for the variables of that object. And that's what a default constructor does. Assign initial values or default values to the global variables. The second one is an overloaded constructor. I put an optional question mark here because you don't have to have overloaded constructors. It's a choice that I made in designing this class to have three constructors. I don't have to have any to be honest with you usually there's at least one a default it allows the code creating the object to provide values for the global variables someone who's building an enemy object may want to put it at a certain x and y position it may want to have it start at a different health variable count so it's nice when a constructor gives you the option of setting the global variables yourself so when I build the object I can set it so I'll input an X value, an input a Y value, an input a health value, and assign those to the global variables in this constructor. Again, it's not a requirement that I do this, but it's nice when a class provides a constructor that'll let you initialize the global variables. This third example of a constructor is known as a copy constructor. Basically, it creates a duplicate object using values from the parameters. Not all classes need overloaded constructors. Again, this is just an option that you can do. So it's called the copy constructor. It's because when I'm building my new enemy object, I'm going to copy the values from this E, enemy E object listed as a parameter. Out of the E object, I'll pull an X position value and store it into my new object. Out of this E object, I'll pull a Y position value and store it in my new object. And out of this E object, I'll pull the health value and store it in my health variable. I'm going to make an exact duplicate with the exact same X position, Y position, and health value. I will, after this constructor runs, have two copies with the exact same variable values. That's what a copy constructor does. It'll be easier to see what these constructors do when I run some examples and put up the objects and show you. Different constructors make a big difference when you create the objects. It boils down to how much do you know about the object at the time you're creating it. Let's look at it, each one of these examples. I'll break down the first example into its little pieces to show you exactly what's going on with this line of code. First up, I'm creating a variable, a reference variable named object1. So I'm declaring the reference variable object1. I'll show it being created here on the screen. After that, I'll do the second half. I'll do on the other side, I'll create my new enemy object. This line of code new allocates a new chunk of memory to hold an enemy object. That's this memory right down here. Right. And then it calls the default constructor. See, there's no parameters here. There's no parameters here. I'm going to call and execute the default constructor in this case. You'll see X position when it executes. The default constructor is set X position 0, and you'll see the 0 show up in my object. I'll set Y position equal to 0, and if you follow that arrow, you'll see Y position then contains a 0. And as the default constructor does, it initializes or set default values to the third 
variable of this object, the health variable, it gets set to 100. I, as the programmer, decided I wanted these to be my default values, and that's what the default constructor does. It initializes these variables. Now remember that equal sign there says I want to assign that new chunk of memory that I just allocated for an enemy object, I want to assign it to the reference object 1. So the variable object one is a reference to an instance of enemy. And that's this line here that is connecting object one reference variable to the physical chunk of memory that represents my enemy. So I broke that line of code down into pieces. On the next example, I think I want to go a little easier on us. Rather than break it down and show the object two being allocated and the object being allocated and connecting it, let's just do that all in one step. I know I'm skipping steps here, but it gets a little boring when you do just little tiny pieces at a time. So I'm showing you the whole object to reference and the enemy object allocated at once, but let's do trace the constructor. I'm executing now the first line of the enemy constructor that takes three parameters. I'm setting X position to the X value assigned or passed as a parameter. So I drew my line a little differently this time. See that 50 that is the first parameter of this line of code that got passed to the variable x and assigned to x x was then assigned to x position so that 50 is really coming from this first parameter of the enemy constructor the value passed to the parameter x is assigned to the x position variable then I'll execute y position equals y in the constructor and again this second parameter 100 was assigned to the variable y y was then transferred to the y position variable so that's where that y position 100 is coming from that second parameter of this constructor finally the third parameter the value passed to the parameter h that's 75 was assigned to the parameter h and the parameter h was assigned to the health variable so that's where that 75 is coming from do you see what this second constructor is doing rather than providing a default set of values for the object it's allowing the code that builds the enemy object to provide the x position y position and health values of the object that's what an overloaded constructor does it builds the object in a different way let's look at this third line of code here I'm going to create an enemy object 3 reference and this time I'm going to pass it one parameter an object 2 parameter so call the constructor with param one parameter. This is called pass by reference. Basically what's going to happen is E is attached to object 2. See this reference variable object 2? E is going to be a reference to the same object. This is called pass by reference and I'm going to assign E to the object 2. An interesting side effect of pass by reference is anything I do to the variable E is going to be coming from actual object 2. So when you look at this first line of the constructor where it says x position equals e dot x position, e is a reference to the same object as object 2. So I'm pulling the value out of e, which is 50, and assigning it to x position of the new object, or object's 3y position. This is why it's called a copy constructor. I'm going to copy all the values out of one object and move them to another object. So that new object will be a copy of the existing object. Next up, I'm going to copy 100 from E slash object 2 to object 3. Remember, E is a reference to this object. Same object as object 2. So when I say E dot Y position, I'm pulling out the 100 from object 2 and moving it over to Y position of object 3. I'm just transferring values from one object to another. Finally, I'm going to copy the 75 from E slash object 2 to object 3. Look at this arrow. This arrow is showing I'm taking it out of object 2 and moving it over to object 3. That's why it's called a copy constructor. When this is all done, I will have two identical objects, object 2 and object 3. Object 3 is essentially a copy of object 2. Note, the copy constructor completes. The parameter E is removed. Object 3 is a copy of Object 2. Those are three examples of constructors. There are other constructors. There's constructors that do more than just initialize variables. Uh, I'm just trying to show you the typical use of a constructor.
Moving on, let's talk about designing a class. It's always good to design before you start coding. We looked earlier at things called flowcharts. Flowcharts are how you design a method. Before you write a method, you probably should flowchart it out and get the design right. Now, how do you design a class? That's what this slide is going to be. How do I design a class? To create a class slash object, you need to come up with a set of variables and a set of methods. You need to design the class before you type in the code. When I'm designing a class, I like to write out two lists. First list is what the object is. Write down all the information that describes what the object is. That's the variables of the object. The second list I like to create is what the object does. What actions do I want this object to take? That list of what the object does, well, that's going to be the methods of the object. First list, what a gun object is. What data or information describes a gun? I'm designing a public class gun here. The first thing I'm going to do is write down a list of things that describe a gun. Now, the things I want to know about the gun is the type of gun. Is it a pistol? Is it a rifle? Is it a shotgun? The second thing I want to do is what is the caliber of a gun? Guns have different diameters to their barrels and one of the most important pieces of information about a gun is the diameter of the barrel. Finally, the third piece of information is how much ammo does that gun currently have? Does it have six bullets remaining, three bullets remaining, four bullets? I decided as a designer of the class of gun, these are the three most important pieces of information that describes a gun to me. The type of the gun, the caliber of the gun, and how much ammo it currently contains. What am I doing here is I'm deciding what the variables should be. So if the type of the gun is important, I'll create a string type variable that will contain a value like pistol, rifle, or shotgun. I'll declare a caliber variable, which is type double uh, in the English measurement system. A 36 is 0.36 of an inch. A 45 is 0.45. In the metric system, a 9 millimeter gun would just be a 9. So it's going to be a value, diameter of the barrel of the gun. And finally, how much ammo? This simple integer, how many bullets it has. When I reload, the ammo count should go up. When I fire the gun, the ammo count should go down. When the ammo count reaches zero, that gun should no longer fire. What does not belong in this list of class? Right? I can always spot a student that doesn't understand classes. When I see a variable like private int temp, declared in the global space. What does temp have to do with a gun? Absolutely nothing. The variables at the top of your class should describe the thing that you're building. If you're in a class gun, it should be something that describes a gun. Int temp does not describe a gun. It does not belong as a global variable. Int temp should be a local variable, not a global variable at the top of the class. The variables should be the core information that describes what the object is. Type, caliber, and ammo count describe a gun object. If I was building a car object, it would be things like make, model, and year of the car. If I was building a book class, it would be the title, author, and number of pages of the book. The core information that describes the thing you're building, that should be your global variables. If you ever think you should put an int temp variable at the top of your class, rethink it. Ask yourself, when you're done with the variables at the top of the class, does this, do these variables describe the thing that I'm building? If they do, great, they belong as variables. If they don't describe the object you're trying to build, they don't belong as variables. All right, so when I'm designing the methods of a class, how am I going to design the methods? I want to focus on what a gun object does. What action does a gun perform? Now, when I think of a gun, I need to create a new gun object. Right? When my character picks up a gun in the video game, I want to create a new gun object and assign it to my character. So I'm going to need some way to create a gun object so I can then assign it to my character. Obviously, I'm going to want to fire the gun. I want to shoot a bullet. So I'm going to have to have, that's what a gun object does. It fires. It fires bullets. And finally, I want to reload the gun. As my character moves through the game, it might want to pick up an ammo cartridge. When it picks up an ammo cartridge, I want to reload my gun. So those are the sort of actions I want my gun object to perform. It may not be all the actions, but again, I'm 
tied on space here so those are the three primary actions I want my gun object to perform let's look first at creating a gun object creating a gun object involves a constructor that's what constructors do they build objects our default constructor here is going to set up and initialize the global variables we just talked about so my default gun maybe the gun that's assigned to the player at the very beginning of level one is going to be a pistol it's going to have a caliber of 45 or 0.45 it's an English diameter on the thing and an ammo count of six I want six bullets in my gun that's what constructors do they build the initial gun object now my fire the gun what what happens when my gun fires now this is an overly simplified fire method again I don't have a lot of space here so all I'm gonna show here is ammo count going down by one if I've pulled the trigger and told that gun object to fire a bullet I know for sure my ammo count is gonna go down ammo count equals ammo count minus one if I have the default value of six I want it to go down to five and every time I fire the gun after that I want my ammo count go down by one what's missing here is probably some sort of check that ammo count is greater than zero once I fire all the bullets out of this I want again this is a simplified version of the fire method obviously in a full version of the game there'd be a lot more code in the fire method all right here's my reload method again this is a simplified version of the reload method when my character picks up an ammo cartridge I want to put that ammo cartridge in my weapon so I want to add to the current number of bullets I have in my weapon ammo count equals ammo count plus ammo add the new ammo to my current ammo and give me a new ammo count again very simplified I'd have a lot more checks in this if it was a full version so in review the list of things that the object is defines the variables that I want to create at the top of the class when I'm designing a new class slash object I write down the list of things that describe what that object is and those will be my variables the list of things the object does defines the methods of the class when I'm designing a new class I list all the things I want my object to do and that list of things that I want my object to, to do is the list of methods I want to write primitive versus reference types turns out there's two different types of variables and we want to understand the difference between the two types variables come in two flavors if you will primitive types are not objects int double char boolean these things are so simple we don't need to build an object out of them they occupy a small amount of memory and therefore don't need an entire object to represent a primitive type we've been using primitive types all along int double char are examples of primitive types but there's also what we call reference types or reference variables these are objects a string is an object an array is an object enemy and gun the classes we've looked at whenever we build a new class we build a new class to create an object these are going to be reference type variables anything that has an object associated with it is called a reference type it means memory has to be allocated for the reference and for the object now let's see some examples and we'll show you how this works I'm going to declare an int score variable here int is a primitive type it will not allocate an object score is going to be an int it's four simple bytes of memory if it is a local variable it will be allocated when the method runs and will have an undefined initial value I put a couple question marks in here because if score is a local variable declared inside of a method it will not have an initial value however if it was a global variable it would be allocated when the object was created and it would be given an initial value of zero so it all depends on where int score is declared if it's declared at the top of the class it will have an initial value of zero if it's declared inside of a method it will not have an initial value let's declare a double variable called money money is a double that takes eight bytes of computer memory as a local variable when it's allocated when the methods run it would have an undefined initial value but if money was a global variable it would be allocated when the object is created and would have initial value of zero so I showed these two variables in their different formats let's assume money is a global variable so money will start life with an initial value of 0.0, .0. 
Let's assume score is a local variable, so score has a question mark for a value. Local variables do not get initial values. Global variables declared at the top of the class do get initial values. Let's declare a char variable named rank. Rank is a char or character variable. It takes two bytes of memory. Put a couple of question marks on there because they're talking about making this bigger or four bytes of memory. Turns out there's so many emojis being allocated to the character set, they may need more memory for a character. But for now, let's consider a character to be two bytes of memory. If it was local, it would be allocated when the method runs and would have an undefined initial value. If it's global, it will be allocated when the object is created and have a no character or zero character things. Uh, but let's remove all doubt. If you're not sure whether a variable is going to have an initial value, you can always put one in. In this case, I said rank equals single quote B and a single quote. I said declare the variable rank and assign it the value B. And now it doesn't matter whether it's global or local. It's going to have initial value. As soon as that variable get created, it's going to have the value B. We really get like three choices here now. If it's local, it has an undefined value. If it's global, it has a default value. If it's given an initial value, then you're guaranteed that it has that value. Now let's use the score variable. Let's assign it a value 100. Values are stored directly into primitive variables. So when I say score equals 100, that 100 replaced my undefined default value with 100. Uh, the assignment value is destructive. Whatever was in the variable score will be overwritten with 100 by this line of code. And you can see the values are stored directly into primitive variables. Let's say money equals 24.50. Let's assign that a value to the money variable. Values, again, are stored directly in primitive variables. What you're seeing here for these non-object primitive variables, the values we assign to them get stored directly into the variables. Now, things are going to change when we switch to reference variables. Reference variables will be objects. Now, I don't say they are objects because you'll see that it's two separate steps. String name. We're going to declare a variable name. String is a class. Therefore, name is going to be a reference variable. Reference variables allocate four to eight bytes of computer memory, depending on whether you're a 32-bit or a 64-bit computer. The initial value that I'm showing in here of null indicates an object has not been created yet. I want to stress that yet. String name doesn't have a value, so there's no need to build an object yet. So an object reference variable with no object gets an initial value of null. Now let's assign name equal to Mario. Assigning a value to the name reference variable allocates memory for an object, then connects or points that reference to the object. The value Mario is not stored in the name variable. The location of an object that contains Mario is stored in the name variable. We have to get used to this. There's sort of an indirectness to this. Notice how in the variable name I didn't shove Mario in there. I built an object. The object contains Mario and I assign that object to the reference name. So let's create another reference variable, enemy monster. Enemy monster. Enemy is a class, so monster will be a reference variable, not a primitive variable. Reference variables will allocate four to eight bytes of memory. The initial value of null here indicates an object has not been created yet. This line, enemy monster, nothing here creates enemy object, so nothing's been assigned to the monster reference variable. It contains the value of null. It's the next line of code that actually builds the enemy object. This new operator allocates new memory for an enemy object. The values 20, 40, and 50 are not stored in the monster variables. They're allocated into the variables. So recall the constructor that allows us to pass initial values for x position, y position, and health. There they are. That constructor assigns those values. When it's all done creating this enemy object, the equal sign will attach the enemy object to the monster reference variables. Are you getting the picture? Class or object variables are different than primitive variables. Reference variables point or refer to objects. They don't hold the actual values. Also notice there's two different ways to create an object. String does not require you to use the new operator. 
Now, normally, I've been saying use the new operator to create a new object. But with the case of Mario here, I said name equals Mario. I didn't have to say name equals new string Mario. This is a special thing about the string class. We use string so much that it was decided it would be done for us. You don't have to use the new operator. What we're going to do here is just say name equals Mario and it will automatically build a string object for us. Now that is not done for other classes. Other classes like enemy and gun require using the new operator. In other classes you'll see that new being used. That's your hint that an object's being created. You do not have to see the new reference when it comes to creating a string object. I don't know what to tell you. Strings are just special. Strings are different. We've got to be used to those string differences. Now it doesn't mean you can't use the new operator on a string. You certainly can. It's just it doesn't have to be used to create an object. Back to a more normal way of creating an object. I'm going to say gun weapon equals new gun here. You see in the red line down here what we're doing. What we're going to do on this line of code is declare and assign an object to a weapon reference. You can do both steps at once. You don't have to declare the reference variable separately from building the object. So I'm going to declare weapon and build a gun object all in one step. Allocates memory for both the reference and the object, then connects or points the reference to the object. The values are the defaults from the gun class constructor shown in this previous slide. So I'm going to call the gun constructor with no parameters which means I want type to be pistol and caliber point 45 and again once all this object is created it will be assigned to the weapon variable very important for you to understand the difference between a primitive variable and a reference variable primitive variables store the values directly into the variables in a reference we store a reference or pointer to the object in a reference variable We'll see many more examples as we continue on. If you don't quite get references down on this slide, there'll be plenty more in the following slides and lessons. Kinda in summary, primitive types int double char are small fixed amount of memory. And the values are stored directly into those variables. See the 100 stored directly in score. See the 2450 stored directly into money. Reference types need memory for the variable any object. A reference like monster has space allocated for the reference monster and the enemy object. The value in a reference points to or refers to the object. You can see the 20, 40, and 50 are not stored directly in monster but a reference pointing to the object that contains 20, 40, and 50 is stored in monster. Private versus public. Now I'm starting to throw the keywords private and public in here. It's time to get a good explanation of private and public. The keywords public and private specify the access mode of a class variable or method from outside the class. Public means everyone should be able to access this element. Anyone can call a public method like get year in this example. Private means very restricted access. No one outside the class can directly access the private year variable. Usually the class is declared public. This allows others to build objects from this class. So if some other code wants to declare car object equals new car, because car is public, they have that ability to build a car object. This would be the code that executes from another class or file and the public class allows that other program access to the car class slash object. If you were to declare a class private, it means only your code, no one else would be allowed to create an object from your class. A private class password to input and verify password would make sense for security reasons. So it's rare that we declare a class to be private, but if it's something that only your code wants to deal with, then you would possibly declare a class private. And again, password and security type things are the only types of classes. So let's focus on the private int year. What does private mean when we declare it private? We're going to create a car object equals new car. And then we're going to try and say object.year equals minus two. Now, when you declare something to be private, it will affect the code and who can access it. Private will affect the code above and determine if you can directly access this variable. Now, this code, object.year, is outside the class. 
Since it was declared private, I am not going to be able to access it. Now what private doesn't affect is code inside the class. Inside the class car, I can say year equals yr. Inside the class, I could return year. Inside the class, on the left side of the screen, I can access this private variable all I want. On the right side of the screen is the code outside the class of the car, and it is not going to be able to access year. So when I try to assign a new value to year, it's going to say, no, that's private. When I try to access object.year, it's going to say, no, that's private. So private effects access outside the class. Any code outside the class car will be denied access to private. Private and public determine what reference variable object will be able to access directly. Since car is a public class, we can create an object from it in the code outside the class. So I've created the car object. This line of code is executed, and you can see it listed here as an object. Now I'm going to attempt to do an object.year equals minus 2. This is a big fat error. Access mode private means code outside the class cannot directly change the year variable. This will be a syntax error. The compiler won't allow you to do it. Private means outside the class, I'm not allowed to access the year variable. So if I'm not allowed to access the year variable, how do I change it? By calling the public method set year. You can request to change the private year variable by calling the very public method set year. Follow this arrow. Set year is declared as a public variable. So objects certainly can access something called public. It'll pass it the parameter 2016. As it passes at the parameter 26, it'll make sure that it's reasonable. They didn't have very many cars before the year 1900, and I don't want a car from the year 3000. So I'm going to do a little test. Is the parameter 2016 reasonable? 2016 is greater than 1900, and it's less than 2025. So I've declared the parameter to be reasonable. This is a true statement. I'll go ahead and assign 2016 to the year variable. Since the input parameter YO was a good value, the setter goes ahead and changes the value of the private variable year. Inside the class, we have full access to the year variable. A good setter method should do as it just did and verify the input is good. It should not accept an input for the year variable like minus two, it should reject it. Access mode private means code outside the class cannot directly access the value of the year variable. If you follow the arrow, you can see that year was declared to be public. So if I try to access object.year outside the class, I will not be allowed. This will be a syntax error. So if I'm not directly allowed to access the year variable to access its value, how do I get its value? By calling the public method getYear. You can request the value of the private year variable. Clearly, Get year is declared to be public. If you follow the arrow, get year is declared to be public. So I can call get year. Get year will return the 2016 for me. Tracing the code, the method will return the value in the private variable year to the code outside the class car. So a copy of 2016 will be sent back. And that copy will be assigned to the year variable right here. That's what getters and setters do. Set put values into the objects, get methods pull values out of the method. So I pulled a copy of the variable value 2016 out of the object, did not violate private because this is a public method, and I was able to get a copy of the variable. To show you how private guards the value stored in an object, let's call the public set year method with a bogus argument, a bad value for the year variable. Minus two is not a legitimate year for a car. Minus 2 greater than or equal to 1900 is a false statement. I don't even have to check the rest of it. Year is outside the boundaries. There is no car built in the year minus 2. So it is a bad value. What should a set method do? It should jump to the else. Since the if is false, the code will jump to the else. And rather than assign a bogus value to the year variable, it'll output a message bad year minus two. Notice the minus two was not assigned to the year variable. Instead, it outputs bad year colon minus two. To inform the caller, minus two is not a valid car year. That's what a good set method to do. You give it a good value, it'll assign it to the private variable. You give it a bad value, it will reject that. 
private variables guard the value stored in objects, preventing what we call garbage in, garbage out. One of the oldest statements in computer science is garbage in, garbage out. If you allow bad values to be stored in your object, then you can only produce bad output. It's very important. There's a pattern here. We like to declare our variables to be private. We like our methods to be public and we like our set methods to guard and make sure that only good values get stored in our objects. Get and set pattern. There's a pattern that's going to be developed here that you'll see when developing a class. A pattern is something that repeats itself. Variables private methods public is a pattern. The general rule is we want to declare our variables private and our methods public. That's a pattern. Get and set methods, getters or setters, also follow a clear pattern. To show the pattern, I will display get and set methods for each variables. Since this will take too much space to do all in one slide, I'll show you a different set one at a time. So I have three variables, make, model, and cost. I'm going to write a get and set for each and every one of them. Let's start with make. Again, this is a car object. Let's say I'm programming a car video game and I want different cars to be running around the track on there. Some of the information I'm going to keep track of is the make of the car. Is this a Chevrolet? Is this a Ford? Is this a Toyota? To see the pattern for a set method, set methods insert data into objects. The pattern for the name of a set method is usually set and the variable name. So I want to set or put a new value into the make variable. I'll call the method set make. A get method, I want to get the value of the make variable. I'm going to pull data from the object. The pattern is get and then the name of the variable that I'm trying to get. So get make will get the value of the make variable. Set make will put a new value into the make variable. Set methods have an input parameter the same type as the variable that it is setting. Notice up here at the top that make is a string variable. So the input to the set method should be of type string. I want to provide a new string value for the make variable. The input parameter should be type string. Get methods have an output or return type the same as the variable is getting. I'm going to get the value of the make variable, so it has to return a string. If make is a string, get make should return a string. Are you seeing the pattern? If this is a string, the input parameter of the set should be a string. The output or return type of should be a string. Set methods assign the input parameter to a private variable. So I'm taking the parameter that the set gets called with and assigning it to the global variable. Get methods return the value of a private variable. So it simply returns the value of make. Get make returns the make variable. I'm not too pleased here. I didn't add any error checking here to set make. I probably should have. Uh, but that's another pattern that set methods should do. They should always verify the input. New code here. I'm replacing my set and my get methods. Now I'm going to set and get model this time. The model is different, right? The make could be Honda, but the model could be Accord or Civic. So we want to keep track of the model of the car too. So again, follow the pattern here. Set methods insert data into objects. The pattern of the name of the method should be set slash variable name or set variable name. So if I'm going to set a new value into the model variable, I'll call the method set model. Get methods pull data from the objects. So the name pattern is get and the variable name. So I want to get the value of the model variable. I'm going to call it get model. See the pattern? All I really changed from the last set was the name. Instead of set make, I got set model. Instead of get make, I have get model. Set methods have an input parameter, which is usually the same type as the variable is setting. Again, model is a string type, so the input parameter to set model is going to be a string type. Model is a string type, so the return value of get model is going to be of type string. The pattern holds. Model is a string, so set model has a string input parameter model is a string so get model has a string output set methods assign the input parameter to a private variable so i'm just going to take that input from set model and assign it to the global variable model get methods return the value of a private variable so i'm just going to take whatever is in here and return that from it set model follows the same pattern that set make had 
get model follows the same pattern that get make hat. The only thing I'm sorry I didn't put into these slides is I did not do some error checking here. It would have been nice to verify that model is a valid model. New code, new type, tracking the cost of the car. How much is it going to cost us to buy this car in the video game? But the pattern's going to hold. Set methods insert data into objects. So I am going to name this set cost because I'm setting the cost value. Get methods pull data from objects. So I'm going to name it with the pattern of get cost to match the variable name that I'm getting out of the object. See the pattern? All I'm doing is changing the name. Set methods have an input parameter that is the same type as the variable that is setting. Cost is a double variable, so the input parameter set cost should be a double variable. Get methods have an output or return type that is the same as the variable it is getting. So cost is a double variable. Get cost should return a double. Pattern holds. Cost is a double. Set cost has a double input. Get cost has a double output. Writing set and get methods is easy once you understand the pattern. Now, again, the one thing I haven't been showing is a good setter should verify the input to prevent garbage in, garbage out. Set methods assign an input parameter to a private variable. It'd be nice if you made sure that's at at least a reasonable value. I've added this to set cost. If C is greater than or equal to zero, meaning you can give away a car for nothing, cost of zero, but I'm not going to pay you to take a car. Get methods return the value of the private variable, so you can see that get cost is returning the cost variable. Pattern holds only the names and the types change better setter checking is the only thing that I would want to put into your mind here you know make sure the cost is within a reasonable range once you know the pattern writing more get and set methods is easy code generators can easily write them just add better input checking to set methods think of objects as mega variables they can store multiple pieces of information and set methods put values into the objects and get methods pull values out of the object. Static variables and methods. Static, to put simply, means no object required. Static variables do not require an object before they exist. Non-statics do. Static methods do not require an object to run. Non-static methods do. Statics are sometimes called class variables and class methods because they're part of the class enemy, not part of the object. Again, here's a very simplified class enemy, so you can focus on the static. There would be more variables and methods in a full version of class enemy. But I'm stripping it out so you can see how the statics work. So this is new. We're going to create a static variable. And one and only one copy of the count variable will be created. Since count is declared to be static, one and only one copy of the count variable will be created. I could go on to create a hundred enemy objects, yet it'd still be this one count variable. As a non-static variable, one copy of the health will be created for each object. If I create a hundred enemy objects, I'm going to have a hundred health variables. Static means one variable for all objects. Non-static means one variable per object. Static variables are shared. Uh, static variables can be used so objects can communicate. If a static variable is created, objects can send messages back and forth between those static variables. Now, I wanted to show you here enemy count down at the bottom of the screen here. I say enemy.count with an initial value of zero. I've created this before I've even created an enemy object because static variables exist before you create an enemy object. Back to the method side. A static method can run using just the class. If I want to execute a static method, I can say class name dot static method. Get count here is declared as static. So if I want to run get count, I can say enemy dot get count. A non-static method is run using an object. I have to use an object variable or an object reference and execute a regular method. So this is a requirement. I'm going to create an enemy e1 equals new enemy 
and then I'm going to say e1.gethealth. Get health, which is not shown, is a non-static method. If I want to run get health, the non-static method, I have to use an enemy object to do it. An object is not required to run a static method. An object is required to run a non-static method. Let's write some code and see how it works. Trace some code. Remember static, no object is required. I can run the get count method before an object is created. The static variable count exists before an object is created. Count equals zero means it'll have an initial value of zero. So I'm going to execute this system.out print line count is and call enemy.getCount. So it's going to execute enemy.getCount. When it ex executes enemy.getCount, it will return the current value of the count variable, which is zero. Once that method is executed, we can do the full system.out print line. So count equals zero is output to the screen. And again, where did that zero come from? It came from enemy.count and was output to the screen. When we complete the print line method, notice how it was done without an object. Static methods do not require an object. Static variable count exists before the first object was created. Now let's create an object. Let's say enemy E1 equals new enemy. Create the first enemy object E1. Let's run the default constructor. When the default constructor runs, you'll see it sets the enemy variable to 100. So the E1 object that I'm building here uh, gets its health variable set to 100. And then I'm going to do a count plus plus. Now the interesting thing to notice about count plus plus is it's a static variable. The static variable count is not part of the object. Therefore, it existed before the first object. Therefore, there will be only one copy of the count variable. So I'm going to say count plus plus, and that zero just changed to a one. Now, I'm going to call enemy.getCount again. And this time, when I call enemy.getCount, object E1 has been constructed. And it will return and execute the next line of code. Because there is a one in the count variable, I'm going to see count is one. At the point that this code executes, count contained a one in the variable because I've created one enemy object. Notice how the value of count is coming from the one and only copy of the count variable. Let's create a second enemy object. You see the count variable is tracking how many object, any objects we have built. So E2 is going to be created. We're going to create a new enemy object E2 to really see how static variables work. We need to create more objects. Static variables are one copy for all objects. Non-static variables are one copy per object. So when we create this second object, boom, you'll see that a second health variable. Creating a second enemy object with a reference variable E2, I now have two health variables. Note health is non-static. Each object gets its own copy of the health variable. And E's two copy is set to 100. Two objects, two non-static variables health. However, count is a static variable. And every time I build a new enemy object, I'm not going to create a new thing. Count is not part of the object. It existed before the first object. Adding one to the one copy of the count variable changes it to two. See, health is non-static, so I have two health variables. Count is static. I have one and only one count variable, a shared variable between these two objects. Now I'm going to call print line again and during the print line the value of count is coming from the one and only copy of the count variable also using object e2 instead of class enemy to execute count we are allowed to use an object variable to execute a static method we don't have to but we can use an object variable to execute a static method and we're going to use the object variable to execute the static method when it executes it e2 when returns two in the count variable because two objects have been created you'll see a two showing up on the screen to really see how static variables works let's create more objects let's create a third enemy object this time the enemy object will have the reference variable e3 it'll call the constructor for the enemy object the constructor will set the heth variable to 100 bottom line I've built three enemy objects I have three non-static variables help I have a health for E1, 
I have a health for E2. I have a health for 3, 3. That's how non-static variables behave. One variable per object. But look here. I do not have three copies of the count variable. Because count is static, I have one and only one count variable. It's going to be shared by all three of these objects. When I do the count plus plus, the value of count goes to three. That is one and only one count variable. During the print line, the value of count is coming from the one and only one count variable. And this fourth print line produces a count equals three. What static methods cannot do is they cannot access non-static variables. Notice that I've declared a static get count here. Static get count can access a static variable count, but it cannot, that's why I drew it in red, it cannot access the non-static health variable. Remember, static methods need to run before the first object's been created. It cannot access an object variable like health. So don't do this. This is an example of what not to do. Do not try to change a non-static variable or even access a non-static variable inside of a static method. Whew. There you have it. That was a big lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next one. Once again, I'm Professor Chris Ferguson. Please visit us at GameSci.com to see more interesting lessons, courses, programming exercises, quizzes, all the fun stuff.